from the closing bell overtime. I'm Morgan Brennan. John Fort is off today. Communication services and tech driving the Nasdaq's gains, while real estate and financials were the biggest losers in today's session. Lululemon and Nike sinking the consumer discretionary sector as well, following those disappointing outlooks with our market panel, Tom Lee of Fundstrat and Jose Rasco of HSBC Global Private Banking and Wealth. Good afternoon to you both. I mean, it was a really, it was literally, it was a record week for the S&P, the Dow, and the NASDAQ, even though we slipped here uh, in trading for the Dow and the S&P. Uh, just the fact that we did reach new highs this week. Tom, I will start with you. How much of this is Fed? How much of this is ongoing AI enthusiasm? How much of this is economic data that continues to surprise to the upside? Um, it's all of the above, Morgan. Um, it's always a good sign when not only is the S&P 500 making a new all-time high and you know building on four consecutive months of gains, but it's coming when the other important indices like the NASDAQ and the Dow confirm those highs. I think we got... A lot of good economic data recently. The economy is very resilient and corporate profits have been also surprising to the upside. But now we have monetary policy that is confirmed to be dovish and at a time when there's $6 trillion of cash on the sidelines. So to me, these are all positive signals for stocks to, to make further gains. And I, I think sentiment continues to be uh, overly cautious. Okay. Jose, how do you see this, especially as we have seen market leadership broaden out as well? You've now got something like 80 percent of the S&P 500 constituents trading above 200-day moving averages. And we did get not one, but two strong IPO debuts in this market this week, too. Yeah, look, I, we agree with a lot with what uh, Tom said. But I, I think if you look, the cyclical side of the economy is probably going to slow because rates are high. And even if the Fed cuts, uh, rates are still high. So the cyclical side, we should see some slowing. But you've got the four underlying secular themes that are going to continue to drive the economy upward. And we think multiples out and, and the market upward as well. So we're, we're still bullish on U.S. equities. And remember, 94, 95, uh, at the beginning, it was a couple of stocks that led this whole thing on the tech side. And that broadened out. And we have not yet seen the power of, of the productivity gains we're going to see here from AI and a host of other technologies, right? Um, and I think that has yet to happen, and that, that's going to help boost earnings as we go forward. Um, and that's positive for markets. So, yeah, we're, we're bullish as well. Okay. So, Jose, when, when, I hear you t when I hear you talk about cyclical parts of the market maybe perhaps slowing here, I mean, we do have industrials trading at a record high, materials, some of these other more cyclical, cyclical sectors. Does that mean that you take a step back as an investor right now and say maybe take some profits, maybe put your, put your money to work in other parts of the broader market? I think you're going to see that just from a valuation perspective, right? Growth has outperformed value dramatically this year, right, year to date. And, and I think that's going to factor into people's decisions. You can you can dollar cost average your way into some pretty good uh, stories in other sectors. But the growth perspective remains in place. And we think that's where you want to be. Uh, remember, look at the Philly Fed from yesterday. The number, the top line number was not great. But if you look at prices paid, came down a ton. New orders soared. And most importantly is the Philly Fed CapEx index. And that's something that for Tom's ideas and mine is crucial because it's telling you corporate America is still investing in long-term planning to build a more resilient economy. And they want to make sure they're on the front burner of that, not at the end of the train. So um, I think you're going to continue to see that. That's going to help lift valuations. But clearly, there's going to be some rotation of value here as growth has outperformed dramatically. Tom, and, and small cap as well has an opportunity here okay. in, in our mind. It's like you took the words out of my mouth, Tom, because I, I know that you're bullish on small caps. You came on the show at the end of last year, beginning of this year, and you said, look, we, we see potential for 50 percent upside in the Russell 2000. I mean, Russell 2000 is now trading. It had a strong week as well. It finished this week up 1.7 uh, percent. We're now trading at levels that we haven't seen in two years. Do you still stick by that thesis? Is there still room to run, especially if you do see a Fed that at some point later this year begins to cut rates? Um, yeah, I think the small caps is really emblematic of like the kind of investment you want to make if the Fed is turning dovish. Because number one, um, you know, as monetary policy eases, well, CEO confidence is going to go up and capital spending should accelerate. That's a lot of cyclical earnings for the Russell. There's a lot of financials exposure in the Russell 2000. So as the Fed is cutting rates and interest rates could fall, that's really positive for the financials. And 
there's um, a pretty big tech component as well, but it includes biotechs, and those benefit from falling rates and easy money. So, I mean, to me, the small cap kind of captures a lot of the things that can go right. And the PE um, yesterday, uh, you know, the PE is at a, almost a 22% discount um, to the S&P. On a price-to-book basis, it's a 44%. It's at 44%, so it's a 56% discount. These are That's a lot of room for multiples to expand, especially if rates are falling. Okay. Uh, Jose, we also saw a lot of buying in bonds this week after we had seen yields start to creep higher. Uh, that reversed itself. Is fixed income compelling here, or do you really put more money to work in equity since the market more broadly or investors more broadly are so risk on right now? Well, look, you have to take into account the auction calendar, right, and, and what is going on. We're, we're reissuing about a third of government debt in the next 12 months. So there's certainly something to be said about the calendar. And what does that do to volatility and fixed income and equity markets? And that's going to be a factor. If you remember no, October, November period, rates backed up on a variety for a variety of reasons. One of them was government spending and one of them was the auction calendar, right? Uh, so we expect that to be a factor here in April, uh, no question about it. So you could see yields back up a little bit, but the long-term direction is still down for fixed income, the curve becoming more positively sloped. And as Tom mentioned, these things are very positive for equities, especially a positively sloped yield curve, positive for financials. And if you look at small cap, the one thing I would focus on there, in addition to the things Tom said, is I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation. We're seeing a cyclical shift and we're seeing a secular trend in economic activity, especially around tech. And you're going to see large companies gobble up small. I think this is going to happen uh, in, in many sectors and that M&A opportunity is there. So look for them to gobble up some of those companies where valuations look attractive. That's a great way to grow, right? Okay. We'll be watching for it. Gentlemen, thanks for kicking off the hour with me, Jose Rasco and Tom Lee. Uh, my thanks to you both. In a week where the Dow and the S&P 500 are just finishing their best week since December, the NASDAQ since early January. While well, Tesla shares under pressure following a production cut in China and a senator calling for the SEC to investigate the EV maker's board, Phil Lebeau has the details. Hi, Phil. Hi, Morgan. Let's start first off with the production cuts out of China. This report early this morning is really what started the pressure on Tesla shares and remained that way all day long. As you look at Tesla's annual deliveries, we should point out that the expectation has now come down closer to 2 million for deliveries this year after hitting 1.8 million last year. They're cutting their Shanghai production, according to the reports out of China, going from six and a half days down to five days a week. They will be reporting their Q2 or Q, excuse me, Q1 deliveries just after the start of April, usually about April 2nd, April 3rd. As you take a look at shares of Tesla, this stock has just been really under a ton of pressure since the beginning of the year for a couple of reasons, production cuts and pricing pressure. Put those two together and increasingly investors are saying, hmm, maybe I need to hold off on going long on Tesla. Meanwhile, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren asking the SEC to investigate Tesla and Elon Musk. Specifically, she says that there is a financial conflict of interest. The board lacks oversight. The disclosures are inadequate, essentially saying it's too chummy of a relationship. In the, her letter to the SEC, Senator Warren says, by all appearances, it seems the board continues to operate as if Mr. Musk is the techno king who can do no wrong. Well, he has called himself techno king in the past. And apparently, you know, people are saying, is that all he's doing? Is there a relationship here that is too close? Well, Elon Musk responded on X saying, Senator Karen, and he refers to Senator Warren as Senator Karen. Her main economic and tax advisor is FBF, SBF's dad, referring to Sam Bankman-Fried. I suspect some of this is coming from him. That's a reference to the fact that in the past, Sam Bankman-Fried's father reportedly had done some advising to Senator Warren's staff, though there's no indication that this letter had any influence from Sam Bankman-Fried's family. So, Morgan, it's one of those weeks where Tesla shares continue to be under pressure because the EV market overall is under pressure, especially in China when it comes to pricing. Yeah, and that's exactly where I was going to go with you, Phil. The fact that, yes, we can we can talk about some of the political dynamics that are afoot with Senator Warren, you know, here in the U.S. Right. in an election year. But really, China is the main driver of what we're seeing in terms of these broader EV dynamics, especially at a time where there is real concern, both in the U.S. and Europe, that you're going to see some of those Chinese vehicles start to flood these markets as well. 
Well, they would love to come into the United States, but they're going to have trouble getting in here. Right now, there's a 25% tariff. Could mm -hmm. they afford that if they wanted to import here anyhow? Yeah, probably. But the fact of the matter is they're, they're choosing to do it elsewhere, primarily Mexico. That's where you will see the Chinese set up stakes in terms of manufacturing. And if they do that, Morgan, then that allows them through the NAFTA agreement to then import into the United States without a 25% tariff. Ultimately, Morgan, I think where we're headed, whether it's the Biden administration after the election or a Trump administration after the election, you will see some kind of a movement to put higher tariffs on specific Chinese vehicles. Basically, if the Chinese have a, a manufacturing base in Mexico, wouldn't be surprised if whoever is in the White House says we are going to put a tariff on any Chinese vehicles before they're brought into the U.S. Yeah, it's something the Commerce Secretary has uh, mentioned or hinted at to me as well in some of our interviews. Yeah. and certainly puts to your point in the next couple of years the USMC uh, trade agreement into focus for potential renegotiations too. Phil LaBelle, we'll see you a little bit mm -hmm. later this hour with another story. Hope you guys enjoyed in the that meantime, interview Tom there. Tom years. Lee of Funstrat. And, uh, you know, I always like to get his input because he, he seems to have a very good grasp of what is going on in the economy overall. And so it can help us get a better sense of where the markets are, are going to be going. I agree. Uh, you know, the markets are looking very bullish right now, even though we had a down day today. So let's take a look first. By the way, it's Friday, March 22nd. It is after the close. And in this segment of the video, okay, Blue Cloud Trading, uh, what we're going to do is go over the charts. We're going to look at all the sectors. All right. We're going to look at gold, silver, U.S. dollar. And then we're also going to take a look and see how the stocks and the indices did today. You can see the Dow was down 0.77%. NASDAQ was up 0.16%. S&P 500 down 0.14%. And the Russell 2000 dropped the most 1.38%. And when we uh, switch it to the heat map, you can see the one day performance of NVIDIA was actually up 3.12%. Google was up 2.04%. Apple up just half a percent. Amazon was up a little bit. And, uh, but the majority of the stocks and mostly the financials got hit really hard today. Tesla was down a little bit. And, uh, so let's look at the weekly performance. So what you're looking at is Friday's action. Let's see how the, how all these, the S and P 500 did for the week. Pretty good. Okay. So overall really good, except for some companies like advanced micro devices, um, Accenture, you can see the, the when you see that bright red color, it means that it's dropped more than six percent. So that's not good. Um, you know, the darker or I'm sorry, the brighter the color, the bigger the loss, the brighter the color on the green, it's going to be a much bigger move up. You can see Google was up six point seven five and Nvidia up seven point three five for the week. All right. So now what I would like to do is take a look at the charts for the sectors. We're going to start off with consumer discretionary here. Now, it did pop yesterday, right? It had a nice big move. Pretty much the whole market was up, okay? But uh, it did form yesterday in Thursday's uh, action, a great, what they call a gravestone pattern. It's when basically you have a small body like this and you have the wick sticking up above, all right? And then what happened today, as you can see overnight, the pretty much gapped down quite a bit uh, from that level. And, uh, it, you know, it was actually more than 1%, but it actually ended up closing just 0.87% down. Is this uh, stock ETF still in an uptrend? Absolutely. We still have higher highs here, right? We have higher lows from the previous low. So as far as I'm concerned, this is still looking very bullish on, and this is the daily chart. Let's look at the weekly chart too. And you can see, yes, it's holding up. What am I using? I'm using the Ichimoku indicator. And this helps us to quickly assess the situation. What we're essentially looking for is price to be above the Ichimoku cloud and above these moving averages. The green one is the Tenkinson, the highs and lows of the last nine periods divided by two. And the red line, the Kijinson, highs and lows divided by two of the last 26 periods. So it's a little slower. And then we have the Chiku span here projected into the past. That's the closing prices in a line form. And the Ichimoku cloud is, this is projects 26 periods into the future. So it can kind of give us a little bit of insight of what might transpire into the future. 
uh, based on calculations and how this indicator is plotted. So uh, it's the only indicator that I know that has that ability. All right, so let's go to XLP. That's the next one. And we're looking at the weekly chart now. This one here, we did have a lower low back in October on the weekly chart. And now it's finding some resistance at 76.41. I'm not as bullish on consumer staples based on that. So we're going to skip this one on the daily. XLK on the weekly chart, uh, still very bullish, higher highs, higher lows. Everything looks really good. And so uh, I like what I'm seeing with this one on the weekly. Let's look at the daily. Also looks good. It did drop uh, a little bit, but then it came back. So it was up 0.03%. All right, let's look next at, let's see here. Go back there for a second. That's technology that we're looking at right there. Uh, the industrials. Industrials in the daily chart, it dropped a little bit, 0.35%. Um, we're still in a very strong uptrend. It was. It's expected that price could drop a little bit more, come back to its equilibrium level. Whenever it comes back to the Tenkinson, you know, it generally will either kind of get stuck on it or bounce off of it. All right. That's a very... Uh, important uh, moving average in this indicator. And uh, it's considered the equilibrium level, all right? Let's look at this on the weekly chart. Okay, so on the weekly chart, it also looks really good. It was, again, just down 0.35%. Financials on the weekly looks really good. We do have a, a longer up uh, wick here on the top, but it's still very bullish. Let's, how about the daily chart? We did create a bearish engulfing pattern, but it's it's going to probably find support here at the Tenkinson. Um, nothing to be concerned about at this point, as far as I'm concerned. But it was a down day. It was down the, the most, probably down 1.15%. Energy was down 0.25% on, this is the daily chart we're looking at now. And it's formed a spinning top. Now, uh, in this case, my expectation is it's probably going to drop. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I think it's going to drop because if price gets under the low of that candle there, all right, typically price likes to gravitate back to the Tenkinson. And that's like a magnet for pricing. And so that's my expectation. If we do see more down days next week on energy, that's uh, more than likely to drop down to that level. That's about two, almost 2%, 1.79%. That's the daily chart, and on the weekly, it looks bullish, okay? And remember, folks, if you guys are long-term investors, you really want to pay more attention to the weekly charts, all right, versus the daily. The daily is a good way to uh, find the proper entry, okay, once you've de determined that the weekly charts are bullish and it makes sense to be going long. This is a bullish chart, even though right now we're going to probably find some resistance at this level, still we have a higher um, we do have a higher low than that low. We have a higher high here, okay, than that high. So let's keep going with this. Um, XLB on the weekly chart, very bullish. Um, more than likely to find some resistance, though, at this pivot candle right here. Let's zoom in on that one. It's uh, That was from January 7th of 2022, and the high of that candle was uh, $92.31. So let's let's make sure we get that proper dollar amount. 9231. We can type it in here. And there it is. So now we know that you know it's more than likely because of how far we've gotten from our equilibrium level that and it's gonna and it's gonna find some resistance here. We may have a, a pullback. And that's totally okay. I mean, it's uh, not a bad thing to get these little pullbacks. We had it right here, yeah, before price found support at the Kijinson in the cloud and, and went up. And we'll probably get it again here, and then it will probably take off once again. So that's what I'd be looking for with uh, the materials. I like the, the chart, but I'd be concerned right now. Uh, on the daily chart, let's switch it to the daily for a moment. You know, uh, we it was down 0.63%, you know, starting to hover close to that resistance level of 92.31. Okay, let's go to the next one. XHB, that's Home Builders. Home Builders has been doing really well recently. You can see that in the chart here, very strong uptrend, right, on the weekly chart. And on the daily chart, it got a little bit ahead of itself here and it, it dropped a little bit, 
um, but the ADX, that's the, the indicator you see down here below, all right, from the directional movement index, it's moving up, very bullish when that is happening. It shows momentum is strong, okay? Uh, the Ichimoku indicator, though, is a little bit more sensitive. So it's going to tell you when the momentum starts to come out, when it starts to decline, as it did right there a little bit. So it's based on the price. So, of course, it's going to be very uh, much more sensitive to that. All right. So, yeah, what would I do in this situation? I'd wait for it to see ne next week. Will it get above the high of this candle? You know, the one eleven thirty seven. If it does, then it's more than likely to continue. But if it does get under the low of this red candle, which is 110.02, then expect it to drop a little bit further, probably about 2.5%. Uh, it could go, you know, depending on how the markets keep playing out here, it could drop as, as low as 5.5% before it starts finding support at the Keijins in the red line. Uh, healthcare. Healthcare. Okay, so this one, it, we're looking at the daily chart. It's it's actually closed under both moving averages here, um, but it is stuck inside of a range, and um, I, I certainly wouldn't be entering a long position based on this. Okay, uh, that's the daily chart, so it's not quite ready yet. On the weekly chart, it's been kind of stuck in this range, and so we have a spinning top. I'm sorry, we have a uh, doji, which is a reversal candle. But we've had multiple reversal candles at the top of this move. So let's hope it doesn't break down. But it is holding up on the weekly chart above the Tankinson. Very bullish. How about utilities? Utilities on the weekly have been under the cloud, right? They've been under here for, for a while. It's been the most underperforming sector. And so in my opinion, it's not ready for the big time yet. And uh, I wouldn't be getting in there. Daily chart looks a little bit more bullish. It broke above the cloud, but we don't have that confirmation on the weekly, so I'd stay out of this one. Real estate on the weekly chart just today closed under the Tankinson. It was down 1.18%, so maybe this one was the one that hit got hit the hardest. Um, so I would not be entering a new long position. If you're holding this as a long-term investor, it's not broken down yet as far as uh, getting below this low the low of this pivot candle, uh, the low of that one was 3708. If it does, that's when I'd be mostly concerned, okay? All right, let's see the next one. Now, oh, we do have the VIX volatility index. This tells us how volatile the markets are. And you can see it's a 13, that's very low. So even though the markets dropped today, there's no fear that has come into the markets uh, that caused this. It was just, I think, profit taking, essentially. Uh, U.S. dollar, UUP, is the ticker symbol. Uh, this one on the weekly chart is moving up, but as you can see, it's under the, the Ichimoku cloud. So that's bearish. And it's formed what's called a megaphone pattern. It's when you have a higher high than the previous high, but you also have a, a lower low than the previous low. So it's kind of like in no man's land here, all right? So as long as it's, it tends to be more bearish than bullish, really. And we do, if you look at the big picture here, you can see that we do have a decline from this all-time high there. It has dropped, right? So we have a, a lower low here from that high. So personally, the US dollar, uh, I would not be entering a long position as an investor. It did do well today in the daily though. It broke above the Kumo. The Kumo is the Ichimoku cloud. So it looks very bullish. And, and when that happens, uh, when the dollar strengthens, usually the markets tend to have an inverse reaction to it and start to drop. And that's why the markets dropped a little bit today. And uh, let's take a look at silver. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at the indices also at the end here, just so you can kind of get a quick sense of what's going on. Um, silver is on the daily chart. It closed under the Tankinson. I'd stay out of this one for now, okay? On the daily and on the weekly, um, we have a bearish candle. I wouldn't be entering a long position as an investor at this point. If you're holding it, that's okay because, you know, we're still in a bullish, um, you're above the cloud, you're above the moving averages, um, you know, it's it's but it's, it's just ranging, okay? Nothing really terrible happening there. Gold. On the weekly chart, looks much more bullish. You can see it broke through this resistance level. 
This happened back on um, March 8th, and it's been staying above it, but we do have a reversal candle here. Inverse hammer on the weekly chart. So it could, it could potentially come back, retest 194.01 before taking off again. And then what about the daily? Daily, you can see here, it's breaking down a little bit. It got under the Tankinson. It was down 0.8%. Bitcoin, since they do talk about Bitcoin a lot, let's talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin, um, the price has dropped to $63,664 uh, from its all-time high here of 73000 let's see, what is that high? 73,819, right? Uh, no, 73,689. That's the all time high right there. So basically, it's, a, it's sort of like ranging, it's stuck in the equilibrium zone. And when it's inside the zone here between the Tankinson and Kijinson, the best thing to do is just sit on your hands and not do anything. Uh, I'd be very concerned, however, if price gets under this level, Let's see what that low is. The low is 60,792. Let's draw that in there, 60,792. Okay. So that would be the level to be really paying attention to. Because if it get, you get a closing candle under that, or maybe even this one, this is another pivot candle right here. It could be that one too. I don't know. You may want to be a little bit more, give a little bit of space there. But if it gets under that 60,140 that you see right there, that could be the catalyst where it just continues to drop and uh, comes down to the cloud. And if it does, we're talking about a good drop of about 25%. Okay, you can see it measured right there from where I've got it. By the way, the software that I'm using is called TC2000. If you want to use this type, this software here, there is a link down below in the description section under the video, and there's a link uh, so that you can use this um, chart as well. All right, and there's a discount for subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed yet, you should definitely subscribe. Okay, so let's take a look next at, I wanna look at the Russell, because that's one of the things that they're talking about. And, uh, you know, Tom Lee, is a big proponent, and I am too. I really do feel like Russell 2000 this year will do very well. It is underappreciated, and but it's not quite there yet. We're not, we haven't exactly hit that point. Uh, we did close above for two days now, above this 205.49 level. And, um, you know, I drew this back on February 13th. And I said, like, we really need to get a very bullish candle, similar to this green candle, a nice bullish candle like that one, maybe, or that one. We need it above this level, and we need high volume to corroborate it, all right? We want confirmation with some high volume down below. If we get that, I think that will be the signal, all right, the catalyst that's going to make this um, uh, take off, essentially, all right? So that's what I'd be looking for. You can see on the, when we switch to the weekly chart how many times we found resistance here in the past. And so it's been kind of getting stuck in this range. Uh, that's the weekly chart. Let's look at the daily. Again, daily, you can see it, it came back into that under the 205 level today. It dropped 1.38%. We didn't have that bullish green candle here, right? We had a reversal candle. We had a little wick on the top there, small body, nothing very definitive about a bullish move that is breaking above this this range and when it broke above here it was just barely above so that also didn't convince me in the past when it got above you can see these all these reversal candles all right so the candles can tell you a lot about the psychology of what's happening it can tell you a lot about what's happening in the markets about the the um, basically the sentiment sentiment of the um, buyers and sellers and today's the sentiment tells us a lot of selling going on. Price opened at this level, closed down here under that level. That's why it's a red candle for those of you who are new to technical analysis. Um, so that's the Russell. Let's take a look at the SPY very quickly. This one was down just 0.19%. Okay, but it's still in a very strong uptrend on the daily, very strong uptrend on the weekly. Nothing to be very concerned about here, folks. Don't be thinking that this is going to drop and fall apart and everything else. We don't have that signal yet. 
Once we get that, I'll be the first one to let you know. The Qs, QQQ on the weekly chart, very bullish. It was up 0.11%. I like this. And let me get rid of that little yellow thing there. Okay. Let's go to the daily chart. And this one looks good too. It's just been, you know, it dropped a little bit and then it moved back up. So it was up for the day. Um, all right, guys, that's going to do it, I think, for this video. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, hit that like button and subscribe. It doesn't cost a penny to subscribe to this channel. It's very, it's very free. And um, I really appreciate it. It would be helping to support the channel so that I can continue bringing more videos like this one to you. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. I will catch you all in the next video.